Hello everyone, let me begin by warmly welcoming you to this eTex featuring hybrid session. eTex is a series where we highlight the amazing work of the eatris community, from institutes to experts, partners to projects and translational topics. Today's session is all about imaging techniques in clinical applications. It's the final part of a trilogy of eTex sessions, hosted by eatris and co-organised with the Hybrid Consortium. I'd like to say a few words about Eatris for those of you who are new to us. In this slide, you can see some examples of the initiatives that we're involved in, and there are many, many more that Eatris is engaged in within translational medicine. We have over 100 research institutions in our network that span across our five different scientific platforms. So what do we do? Well, Eatris provides access to research, develops new research tools, and provides education and training, amongst lots of other things, with an overall mission to improve and support the translation of novel biomedical research outcomes into the clinic. Specifically looking at the Eatris Translational Image Centres, you can see that we have around 48 centres in 10 countries. If you're interested in finding out more, feel free to check out our website or get in contact. So that's a very brief introduction to us. Today, we're lucky enough to have three fantastic speakers and to introduce each of them and the hybrid consortium further, I'd like to hand over to Thomas Bayer from the Medical University of Vienna. So Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you. Jake, thank you very much <clears throat> for the nice introduction. My name is Thomas Bayer. I'm the scientific coordinator of this hybrid ITN which soon comes to an end after a spectacular four-year journey. And I'd like to thank Iatris for giving us an opportunity to complete the third part of this series of webinars. So HYBRID is an acronym that stands for Healthcare Yearns Bright Researchers for Imaging Data. It's a consortium that was formed a couple of years ago in order to uh, promote hybrid imaging, that is dual modality, anatomical and functional or molecular imaging, such as PET-CT, PET-MRI, or SPECT-CT, and our objective was to basically increase the armamentarium of tools for personalized medicine by bringing in hybrid imaging modalities and more so the uh, data analytics that follow these type of imaging exams. So we really aspire to move one step or two steps further beyond the narrow vision of radiomics and really bring in additional biomarker information um, based on hybrid imaging that can be entangled with uh, clinical and uh, non-imaging information. So we are very excited to bring to you three eloquent speakers with a fantastic gender balance, no less. Um, this is Malena Fischer, Vicky Go, and Stefan Nicola. And uh, to introduce the first speakers, all I have to say is that it's Professor Malena Fischer who has made a name in the promotion of PET-CT and lately also pet -MR for clinical practice. Malena started out as a medical doctor specializing in clinical physiology and nuclear medicine out of the Riggs Hospital in Copenhagen. And since a couple of years, she's now joining the team at King's College London. And her talk will cover a very important aspect, which is the liaison of PET-MRI as the most advanced hybrid imaging modality in the context of radiation therapy planning. Malena, the floor is yours and thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you for the introduction, Thomas, and thank you for the invitation. I'm going to give a short introduction to hybrid imaging in radiotherapy planning and briefly introducing uh, two uh, projects I'm, introduced, I'm uh, involved with. One is a part of the hybrid consortium. Uh, radiotherapy is a very important treatment modality in cancer. Approximately 50% of all patients with cancer with, uh, will at some point in their treatment receive radiotherapy, that being either as, uh, as palliation or more likely as a part of the radical uh, curative intent uh, treatment. Radiotherapy is often combined with other modalities such as chemotherapy, targeted therapy or uh, surgery. The reason why radiotherapy is so efficient is that tumor tissue tends to be more sensitive to ionizing radiation as compared to normal tissue. So when planning uh, radio uh, radiotherapy, the aim is to obtain the perfect balance 
between giving a high dose to the tumor to achieve local control over the tumor, and at the same time, minimizing the dose to the surrounding normal tissue. That will be following the blue curve on this uh, graph. This, of course, is uh, not easy, and this has been done in many different ways over uh, a long period of time. Uh, but minimizing the amount of normal tissue being irradiated enables a higher dose to the tumor for better local tumor control, as well as a lower dose to the normal tissue and fewer side effects. The development had been from 2D conformal radiotherapy with two beams, beams delivered either anteroposterior or laterally uh, until now um, intensity modulated radiotherapy, which allows the radiation beams to be divided into numerous beamlets to minutely adjust the intensity of radiation given to the tumor and uh, to the surrounding normal tissue. This has at the same time increased uh, the, um, the importance of accurate imaging to tailor uh, the radiotherapy to the tumor. Imaging in radiotherapy plays an important role from the time of diagnosis and staging over to simulation planning delineation of the target and the organs at risk, to symmetry and treatment delivery. In the definition of the target volume, what we uh, aim at is finding the gross target volume or the gross uh, tumor volume. That is all the visible or palpable, palpable uh, tumor. This can be visualized by CT, by PET, MRR, or a combination. On top of this, we add a margin for the clinical target volume, allowing for potential microscopic tumor spread. So the more accurate the definition of GTV is, the smaller the margin we need for the CTV. Finally, the PTV is adding a margin on top of the GTV and the CTV to adjust for any uncertainties in image registration, for example, organ motion, and the daily uh, setup. So if we improve the accuracy of imaging, we can also, again, decrease the planning target volume. And does it matter? Yes, it does. Uh, because the smaller the volume we're going to irradiate, the higher the dose we can give to that exact uh, volume. And even a small change in the gross tumor volume or the margins added for the CTV and PTV can double uh, or um, increase significantly the final irradiated volume. We know already that PET CT can improve identi uh, the identification and the description of the extent of the disease across a number of uh, diagnoses, for example, lung cancer, head and neck cancer, esophageal, cervical cancer, lymphoma, and in brain tumors. One of the reasons behind this is, of course, better identification of spread to regional lymph nodes, but also it can better define um, or discriminate between the malignant and benign uh, tissue, as in this example, uh, where you can see uh, a tumor surrounded by atelectasis, uh, and you would only like to irradiate the tumor, not the entire atelectic area. Further, the combination of anatomy and function improves the inter-observer variability, which again improves the accuracy of the treatment delivery. Third, in the definition of the gross tumor volume, if you combine information and function with anatomy, you can define the area most at risk of relapse. These, this is uh, shown for FCG PET in lung cancer and in, in head and neck cancer. And you can use this information to, uh, to minimize the GTV and also to make sure that you give a high dose to the uh, areas that you are most likely to relapse. This paves the way for the uh, um, for dose painting, targeting uh, the treatment resistant or more aggressive subvolumes of a tumor with a higher dose. You can potentially base this on uh, functional information obtained from PET or uh, from MR or a combination of both. So this leads to the idea of including PET MRI for radiotherapy planning. These are two ongoing projects, one in head and neck uh, cancer and one in cervical cancer, the latter uh, being a part of the hybrid consortium. We know that by combining PET and MR, uh, you can get complementary 
complementary information uh, with regard to function of the tissue. You also get an improved soft tissue contrast. You can decrease the uh, total examination time and the image registration errors. There are also some difficulties because PEDMR, you lack information on electron density needed for uh, attenuation correction and dosimetry in dose planning. This is an example of a, um, of a PEDMR protocol for radiotherapy planning in cervical cancer where you combine both the PET and the functional and anatomical MR. And you can see at the images to your left how the patients are positioned in the PEDMR scanner with the fixation equipments in place so that it can be reproduced exactly for the radiotherapy delivery. So this gives us a lot of information of the primary tumor. Um, but again, as mentioned, we lack information for uh, attenuation correction as well as uh, for dosimetry. So um, Saha Ahangari and uh, Anas Olin have developed a, a deep learning network, a UNET, to generate synthetic CT based on Dixon MRI images obtained as a part of a standard PEDMA scan. This can be used to, for attenuation correction of the PET signal. And as can be seen here, it perform, performs equally well uh, as the standard CT, perhaps slightly better than Dixon. This is just an, one example. If you look at the dosimetry, they also perform, perform uh, quite well. This is uh, data from head and neck cancer, which is published. The, the, the dose volume histogram for the organs at risk um, based on um, synthetic CT and the standard CT are right on top of each other. There's no difference at all. So you can get the CT from your MRI and you can get the functional and anatomical information you need to plan your radiotherapy. This also opens up perspectives, not only for dose planning initially uh, in radiotherapy, but also to do uh, adaptive radiotherapy planning during treatment, again, to address the most treatment resistance area of the tumor. And there are currently studies ongoing uh, with this aim, uh, for example, here at uh, KCL. So to conclude, Hybrid imaging, PET CT and PET MR can potentially improve radiotherapy planning by improving our knowledge on tumor biology, decrease uncertainties related to segmentation. It can pave the way for dose painting and adapt to radiotherapy. And PET MR can potentially become a one stop shop for RT planning uh, with its uh, very high soft tissue contrast, multiparametric information on tumor, and uh, calculating tissue density for attenuation correction and dosimetry using artificial intelligence. However, of course, next step will be to prove that it actually uh, benefits the patients with this uh, next, next step of this tale. But thank you for your attention. All right, thank you very much, Melina, for this uh, very nice and clear introduction to the use of PET-MRI for RT planning. Uh, just checking back with Beatrice that uh, we agreed to have questions at the very end, or would you like me to uh, do questions after each speaker? We were going to do them at the very end, but if you Perfect. have a burning question, then feel free no, to go ahead. Nothing, nothing burning. I'll, uh, I'll leave it to the uh, very end. Thank you again, Marlene. This was really a very nice and concise introduction to this topic. So moving on to the uh, next speaker, our next speaker is uh, Vicky Go again from the same site, King's College London. Vicky is a radiologist and she is the professor with the longest title on our list of acclaimed speakers, uh, the Professor of Cancer Imaging within the School of Biomedical Engineering and Imaging Sciences at King's College London, uh, formerly European Union. Sorry, I had to put this in. Uh, Vicky, thank you very much for joining. Uh, for those of you who don't know Vicky Go, she is uh, an expert in not only radiology imaging, but also hybrid imaging together with Gary Cook, a nuclear medicine physician. She leads the EPETMR program at King's College. She is an expert in assessing tumor heterogeneity by imaging means. And the topic of her presentation today, I'm really looking forward to is assessing, assess, is 
assessing multiple myeloma, a potential synergism effect with integrated PET MRI. So we really look forward to hearing from her about the conjoined use of anatomical and molecular image information. Thank you very much, Vicky. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Thomas. I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully you'll be able to see it shortly. Yes, perfectly. All right, thank you very much. So thank you for the invitation to speak today. It's a great honor. And in this talk today, I will be discussing the current role of imaging in multiple myeloma and exploring really the potential synergisms of integrated uh, PET MRI in disease detection and response assessment. So multiple myeloma is a debilitating bone marrow cancer that arises from the transformation and proliferation of plasma B cells. Transitioning usually through precursor conditions, monoclonal gammopathy, and an asymptomatic stage called smoldering myeloma. And there are typically 140,000 new cases each year, and the incidence is rising, particularly in the Western populations. Progression itself is a complex multi-step process arising from a number of genetic events, as well as changes to the bone marrow microenvironment. And what we see is the release of pro-osteoclastogenic factors, as well as osteoblastogenic inhibitors that causes an increase in bone resorption and the development of osteolytic lesions, weakening the bone structure, as you can see here on this CT scan. Now, currently, the diagnosis of multiple myeloma is made by a combination of factors. Typically, the presence of 10% or more of clonal bone marrow plasma cells, or the presence of a biopsy-proven plasma cytoma, plus one or more of these myeloma defining events, as you can see listed here. Therefore, as you can um, see, that imaging therefore has an important role to play in multiple myeloma through the detection of focal bone disease for diagnosis, as well as other factors such as detecting the presence of extramedullary disease, which is present in up to 15% of cases, and a poor prognostic indicator, as well as assessing disease-related complications such as fractures, cord compression, and also assessing therapy in both transplant eligible and also transplant ineligible patients. Now, currently, the International Myeloma Working Group guidelines in suspected myeloma are pragmatic in that they recognize that advanced imaging may not necessarily be widely available throughout the world. So current algorithms, as you can see here, offer CT, or in the case of the clinical trial setting, FDG-PET-CT, in patients with biochemically suspected multiple myeloma, and then only proceeding to whole body MRI if these imaging tests are negative or inconclusive. However, there is an opportunity here really to improve and streamline imaging for myeloma patients and also to improve their experience of imaging with integrating FDG PET and MRI and therefore bringing together the best of both modalities. So firstly, really, as you can see here on this slide, by taking advantage of the high sensitivity of MRI for focal bone disease, as well as marrow involvement, as you can see with these different bone patterns. And this is supported by data uh, from systematic review as shown here, where the sensitivity of MRI in this particular systematic review was in the order of 68 to 100% versus FDG-PET-CT, which was slightly lower in the order of 47 to 100%. And also from our more recently published study, where we found a sensitivity for bone lesions of 91% for whole body MRI compared to 70% for PET-CT, with actually more focal bone lesions also detected in 41% of patients. In this study, we also found that treatment decisions changed in a higher proportion of patients with the addition of whole body MRI to clinical data compared to the clinical data alone or the clinical data with PET imaging. 
Secondly, integrating imaging will also take advantage of the prognostic information that FDG provides at initial diagnosis. And we know from prior studies, for example, that if you have more than three lesions, an SUV max greater than 4.2, or the presence of PET positive extramedullary disease, that these are all poor prognostic indicators. And finally, thirdly, we know that um, if we integrate PET and MRI, we can also take advantage then of the fact that in the therapy setting, that a lack of FDG uptake following therapy is associated with better outcomes. And if we look at the criteria for minimal residual disease post-transplantation, for example, you can see indeed that FDG PET is now included within these criteria. And imaging negativity here is defined as the disappearance of areas of increased uptake that were present at baseline or the preceding PET CT, or indeed a decrease in SUV to less than blood pool or the surrounding normal tissue. So with that in mind, where are we now with FDG PET MRI? Well, initial published data in the literature suggests that there is a comparable performance across PET CT and PET MRI systems in terms of the number of lesions detected and also in terms of SUV correlations. And this is our current protocol for multiple myeloma patients. The key MRI sequences really are diffusion, the T1 Dixon, which we performed before and also following contrast administration. We also do run T2 sequences, and this is really for assessing the presence of extramedullary disease, which will be present in a small fraction of patients. We do currently stop at the knees in our practice due to the very low incidence of lesions, more inferiorly uh, below the knee. And just to give you a flavor of the type of imaging that we do see, so here is a patient. This is a 62-year-old male patient who had IgA kappa disease and was found on the bone marrow biopsy to have 40% plasma cell bone marrow infiltration. And here, if we look at the PET, the diffusion MIPS, as well as the montage across the PET, the T1 Dixon sequences with and without uh, contrast administration, as well as the diffusion sequences, I think you can hopefully pick up that there are presence of multifocal lesions depicted to a greater extent, particularly on the diffusion and the T1 post contrast imaging than um, there is on, that you can see initially on the PET. And although I've not um, shown the CT here as well, there were also a greater number of lesions compared to the CT component of the PET CT scan that was also performed. And just to show you another example as well, this is a different patient. This is a 60 year old female patient with IgG lam lambda disease. This patient had much more extensive bone marrow infiltration. This was 90% infiltration. And I think you can also appreciate that on the FDG PET and diffusion MIP where there is a greater signal intensity in comparison to the previous patient. And again, you can see that there's concordant diffuse FDG uptake, diffusion signal abnormalities with uh, higher signal and diffusion weighted imaging. There's also darkening on the T1 fat images, diffuse enhancement following gadolinium in infiltration. And the ADC map also shows a much higher level. So this happened to be 0.96 times 10 to the minus three millimeters squared, millimeters squared per second. And yet another example, just again to illustrate this in the therapy setting. So this is another patient, 69-year-old male patient with IgA kappa disease, this time with 50% plasma cell bone marrow infiltration. And again, I think you can appreciate also both on the FDG and the diffusion sequences that there is multifocal disease. So in other words, this patient had lesions that were restricted as well as enhancing. And if we look in the initial early um, scan, which was done post-induction chemotherapy prior to stem cell transplantation. You can appreciate the reduction in FDG activity. I'm just putting the corresponding PET CT images here for reference. And again, here, the corresponding uh, MR component. And I think you can see that post-induction chemotherapy, there is indeed a reduction both in the general marrow background enhancement, as well as the focal lesion enhancement Similarly, a decrease in diffusion hyperintensity. And when we measured the ADC, there was an increase in response to chemotherapy as you would anticipate, 
both in the background marrow, which we see over there from 0.43 to 0.56, but also changes on the lesional basis as well. So these really providing complementary information, particularly in the early response assessment phase. So as we move towards personalized therapy, we are indeed still very early on in the journey towards evidence-based practice. And integrated, but integrated FDG PET MRI really potentially offers a new opportunity, I think, for myeloma patients, particularly in terms of better patient risk stratification and selection for therapy by combining the information. This also provides us with the ability to have a much more comprehensive assessment of therapy effects and really the potential in the future to improve assessment of minimal residual disease as well in combining the information both from PET in terms of PET negativity as well as the negativity on the diffusion and enhanced sequences. As we move into the future, there is a further opportunity for us to improve specificity, particularly with non-18 FDG traces. So here we're talking about uh, studies that are coming through in terms of choline, methionine, as well as pentixafor imaging, uh, pentixafor imaging the chemokine receptor CXCR. We are also seeing directions as alluded to by the previous speaker also in terms of AI enabled acquisition and post-processing. And interesting uh, steps here would uh, include also as this recently published paper, I think it's just been published, looking at CT synthesis, whole body CT synthesis from whole body MR data. And this really brings us a new phase in terms of one step imaging for these myeloma patients. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Cool, Vicky, thank you very much for this, again, very concise insight into one of the applications of PET MRI in clinical routine. If you agree, I would postpone questions to you. Um, I certainly have a couple until after the third talk. So thank you very much again. And our third speaker is um, Stefan Nicola. He is actually, I just saw also a guy with a long title. Uh, Stefan Nicola works in Munich. He's the director of clinical imaging operations at the Department of Nuclear Medicine at the Technical University of Munich. He has been an imaging advocate for decades. Um, he started out in MR, but uh, for better or worse, has moved into the fields of molecular nuclear medicine imaging. Uh, first through PET-CT and later on PET-MRI. He's really an advocate of the use of molecular and hybrid imaging in all traits of clinical research. And today his presentation, even though he knows much more than just the use in cardiovascular imaging will be to look at the uh, aspects of PET-MRI in cardiovascular uses. And it wouldn't be Stefan if we could not rest assured that there will also be some critical remarks that should help us improve the technology in the near future. Stefan, thank you very much for sharing your time. Thanks for the flowers. Um, Thomas, do you hear me and see my screen? Yes, wonderful. Excellent. Um, yeah, well, within 10 minutes, um, giving an idea about cardiovascular imaging is pretty ambitious. So I, I will try to give you an idea why nuclear medicine in general and PET in particular is actually a pretty complex business. Typically, I start with a um, devil's advocate slide. Actually, um, as we have not that, that much time, I skipped it. But just give you an idea, it's still maybe surprising for the one or the other, more than 50% of, of on average of the, of the mortality in, in Europe is coming from the cardiovascular era. Um, and this is actually getting worse than better. Reasons are, um, well, you, you know all the couch potatoes, which actually are these guys which make cardiovascular imaging in a PET MR really complicated because they simply do not fit in the scanner anymore. So we had basically to pre-select slightly. Um, what I also think would be useful is to give you an idea where we are coming from. And in the good old days, when, when I started with PET almost 25 years ago, um, actually the scanners had only 10 centimeters field of view. And the only thing we could do is actually either image the heart or image the brain. But oncology was back then actually not the issue. So back then we had in the era of perfusion and metabolic imaging, these were really the, 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 the golden days of, of cardiovascular imaging using PET. 
What happened um, in the year 2000, and Dr. Bayer um, contributed significantly to this um, disaster for cardiac imaging, basically the PET-CT came around and this completely was a, was a game changer. Something which was completely impossible with the old generation of scanners, which are re were really limited uh, for the 10 centimeters, doing a whole body scan back then was a two hour experiment, if you were lucky. So this didn't really work out that nicely, but introducing the pet CTs, it completely changed. For us, it had um, a certain advantage that all of a sudden there were more pet CT systems out there. So we could try to grab our share and these around 2010, 2015, these were the kind of images we did basically integrating the CT information to the PET information. However, I have to admit this was mostly marketing. So we were trying to attract cardiologists to send us patients. Um, from a throughput perspective, we, um, with the introduction of the PET CT and PET MR is even worse, cardiovascular imaging fell to less than 5% of the patients to, which we did on the scanner. Um, so then basically you see this here, the, the route um, split basically, um, PET-MR had a lot of technical issues um, which took more than five years to be solved. And I think in this we'll show you later, we, we did quite some bit of, of um, really nice studies in that field. But to be honest, the domain today nuclear medicine and PET is whole body imaging. So is we, the numbers of, of neuro and cardiac imaging is, are declining. Actually, you see this here, if you compare this, there's this new guy and he, what really is now the burning um, application is prostate. So gender balance is a cool thing, but here um, we are completely focusing now on prostate. More than 50% of our PET-MR and PET-CT scans today in Munich is prostate cancer. Um, I mentioned that cardiac is not a fully trivial field and the point is simply that we are not alone. And you see this here from a re relatively old guideline. What, what is interesting here is basically the level, the, the class one indication to use imaging in the, um, if, if, if the question is myocardial revascularization is you see this stress echo, nuclear stress MRI, PET perfusion. These are the class one indications. Here actually hybrid imaging comes in, we, we saw a certain increase in interest. However, what you really have to keep in mind that, that people doing cardiac imaging today, invasive endography, CT, and then the others, this is basically falling in frequency by a logarithmic scale. So what we do here is extremely specific. I think this is important to keep in mind in order to uh, avoid frustrations Basically, even if you would develop the most brilliant algorithm in that field, you will have an extremely hard field to compete against invasive cardiologists. This is from a, from a newer guideline and you see the same trend here. There are many, many competing um, mod um, modalities. Interesting, there are modalities which actually perform not that well. However, they are utilized in the millions. So, the, my, my take home message is the cardiac imaging is an extremely complex field and you have to find your, um, the place where you feel um, comfortable. And this is what we did. We were using um, the PET-MR very early. This was the first publication, basically using in sarcoidosis, which is an inflammatory disease. And you see how nicely basically the FDG, the FDG signal and the flow information was very complementary and full volume coverage of this case. So this was one of the, the very early steps we did into this direction. Second large example error is viability imaging. When I basically, um, my, my former boss, Markus Schweiger, he basically in the 80s, he was one of the people developing the concept of viability imaging using PET, which basically means is the tissue alive and does it make sense to revascularize re it? And adding the information from the MR together with the FDG signal, this was a patient with a relatively severe disease image pro very promptly after he was um, resuscitated and delivered to the hospital shows that quite in contrast, so the heart is barely contracting, but there is a lot of FDG, which tells you on an individual basis, there the heart is intact and it makes sense to um, improve the condition of this patient using invasive, um, oops, this was too fast. 
This led to one of the projects what Alberto Villagran did in, as, as part of the hybrid project, basically to reinvestigate our 20 year old algorithms. How are we diagnosing um, myocardial um, viability in terms of how good are we able to predict recovery now integrating also um, T1 mapping, late, 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 late um, gallium enhancing, all in basically an imaging session, which can be done in around 45 to 50 minutes. So very comprehensive, a lot of data. However, um, if I fall back in my devil's advocate um, position, the big question is how much do you really gain as compared to a sequential imaging? So first an MR and then a PET or basically by MR only. The other extremely um, um, interesting project we did is basically a simultaneous injection of MR contrast agents and perfusion agents because in the end, you see this here in red, this is the, the blood, the input function. In blue, you see the, the tissue curves. Nuclear has a very high um, how does, um, how does sensitivity in that sense that we target the complete cells, whereas the MR community is able to go basically only for the spaces in between the cells. However, and this is what um, I did for Karl um, Kunze did a, a while ago, if you compare these images here, the MR, this is a part of a dynamic series, and here the PET, you have the impression that under stress conditions, the heart grows, which is actually not true. What happens is only the epicard is perfused by, M by, by PET tracers, whereas this here's a signal void. So this um, gives a lot of extra information about the disease. Oops. The, going beyond the viability and the perfusion imaging, what we did were, you, again, very similar to the sarcoidosis, we went after inflammation. These are images from patients shortly after myocardial infarction and successful um, recanalization of, of the occluded vessel. And you see here massive uptake of FDG in an, in an um, um, otherwise suppressed heart. So this indicates clearly something. Big question, what is this? And this is actually a follow-up study, which um, Kai Kunze then did. This is again comparing MR technology, namely ECV mapping and FDG. And you see the, the, the change in the extracellular volume very nicely matches in many patients with the FDG signal. Now you can go one step beyond. You can plot the relation between ECV and FDG in all these patients and what you see per patient. So on the personalized level, there is actually a pretty good correlation. If you take the complete cohort, it, it's not working as nicely. And this is a complex issue, but I give you just an idea about the envelopes of these scatter, because the one part is basically patients, which this is then six months later follow up, Patients with an inflamed signal did very well. However, patients with a different amount of um, ECV did extremely poor. So this, these are the kind of, this is a very complex imaging protocol, but for the individual patient, we are pretty convinced that this could be a highly attractive um, option, although a very expensive one. So in the end, um, we see from the PET-MR experience there might be two relatively short protocols. One is perfusion, although to be honest, I think this is a field we lost to, to the other modalities because they are simply cheaper. So our future is most likely here in a compact molecular imaging protocol where we do the complete MR um, imaging stuff, the MR colleagues do. However, we use one tracer with an extremely high specificity, FDG for an inflammation, RGD, also inflammation, AGD for innervation, to come up with a very comprehensive assessment for the patient in a very specific question. In the end, this would, would be the typical exam before very expensive therapies follow to optimize um, the therapy regime. So to conclude, from our perspective, the, the PET-MR expectation in cardiovascular imaging were really huge. However, the results are relatively modest. We saw a couple of really nice highlights but whether the costs really justify um, it is, is something which is really um, time will tell. If you compare to a PET-CT, 
which is roughly 50% of the price, but is doing five times the, or four times the number of patients, you have a pretty hard time to, to negotiate with your hospital. However, and this is why I really, and, and Thomas knows if I say wonderful, this is really rare. It is really a wonderful um, device if you want to validate and explore synergistic options. What is, however, very interesting that PET-CT is getting better and better. I, I mentioned before, this is driven by oncology, but I think there are huge opportunities for the cardiac um, imaging era as well. However, and I think this is something what we really have to keep in mind, if it comes to cardiac imaging, we are not alone. Thanks for your attention. Stefan, thank you very much. Please accept a virtual applause and people mark in your calendar that Dr. Nicola used the word wonderful in yep. conjunction with this imaging modality, which is really a unique uh, aspiration. So thank you very much. These were what I felt three, three terrific uh, talks. If uh, we could set up um, it in a such a way, Stefan, just stop sharing your screen. If we could share it up that we can see all speakers, perhaps. Uh, we got a couple of questions in the chat box and uh, I actually penciled down a few questions myself. And if it's okay with all of you, I'd like to ask at least one question each to the speakers in the uh, order of their presentations. So Malena, um, one uh, question that, that comes to mind naturally is you argued that PET-MRI leads to a reduction in the total examination time. Um, but one could argue using Stefan's last slide about the devil's advocate, that the imaging time for a PET-MR is actually much longer than that of a PET-CT. So which cancers, perhaps you can comment, would benefit from the additional use of the MR in addition to the PET information? Yeah, that, that, that would be a cancer where you use already both PET or, and or CT and MRI. For example, in many patients with head and neck cancer and patients with cervical cancer. So rather than doing two or three different uh, examinations, I know in cervical cancer right now you do a PET CT and then you do a CT and you do an MRI. So if you can do just, just a PET MR, that will actually reduce the imaging time. Mm -hmm. Which I guess is an argument you rarely hear in, in PET MR. Mm. Okay. Um, another question that came up was, and it's also asked in the chat box, what uh, people always ask about the availability of novel traces. So you showed, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you focused pretty much on FDG, but clearly there's a variety of traces that you're using. Is there any sort of uh, key message that you'd like to relay? Does PET-MR lead to the use of atypical traces more than we see with PET-CT perhaps? I hope it will moving forward because one of the things you, you, you can see if you do a PET-MR with FDG, for example, is the close correlation between the diffusion rate images and the FGG signal, meaning you don't really need the FGG uh, in that case. And you could put in another tracer, for example, a hypoxia tracer uh, like Kappa ATSM or F FASA or F MISO, so you can uh, image the hypoxia. So I think that will be a, a definitely a way uh, to go. Uh, another potentially interesting tracer is the new FAPI. Uh, traces, which I think had some promise also in uh, in radiotherapy planning. And again, if you combine that with PET-MR, you will be able to, to get the information from the diffusion bedded images as well as the DC and then combining with, an, with another uh, PET tracer. So, okay. yeah. Uh, Vicky, this takes me over to your presentation. Um, and I'm being a little bit, again, devil's advocate. Um, if I understood you correctly, you showed a couple of data that said that the SUV max value is pretty useless as a predictor to uh, describing this type of disease. Now, um, FDG is one way of looking at bone metabolism, but there is sodium fluoride, which could be used. And I wonder what if you used a mix of both traces at the risk of not being able to do quantification, but at least you get two different metabolic signals that perhaps could add to the information you obtain from MR. Sorry, just trying to unmute myself there. 
I think the concept of using more than one trace and particularly not necessarily relying directly on an FDG, I think is, is an important concept. So we know, for example, that actually for a lot of patients, low hexokinase to expression is, is a challenge really for these multiple myeloma patients. And the ability to image them differently, I think is one way forward. I think the problem with fluoride is it's a bone remodeling agent. So we're not necessarily capturing the disease very much like MRI, you'd just be capturing the changes as associated with the bone remodeling. And some of the questions that we've had also within the chat was, you know, if you had to choose a different tracer, what would it be? Now, people have clearly looked at the uh, choline and methionine in terms of proliferation. And what they have found, for example, is that actually in terms of disease focal lesion detection, we do see a greater number of lesions when we start using these tracers instead of FDG. So that's probably one step forward. And they're probably the front runners at the present if you're thinking about not using FDG. Having said that, Actually, F SUV does have a prognostic value, so which is why it's actually still a relatively good tracer when the uptake happens. So in other words, if there is uptake, which may not happen actually in our, our cohort, for example, after 50% of these, we won't necessarily see FDG uptake. Um, but if you do, and it's high, and it changes, in other words, it drops, and so that after stem cell transplantation, you have, no, you have negativity, then actually you're gonna do okay. So in other words, you know, there is some information within a subgroup of patients with FDG. Going forward, I think people are quite excited about very targeted traces. So we started seeing some data on pentixaphor, but actually for me, things like B cell membrane antigen, which are starting to come onto sort of the horizon, those are sort of the exciting areas really for new, new traces. Okay. I have a question to all three of you, at least with the beginning of PET-MRI. Uh, there were a few debates on the usefulness of dual modality tracers, meaning basically a huge tracer molecules that combine the contrast as well as the molecular aspects of it. This seemed to have been fading out again. What is your opinion about the use of these type of dual modality tracers? Maybe Stefan, you could uh, start, given that you had not a chance to say something. I, I think... We, we, we tried something like this with, um, with, hyper, with MR hyperpolarization. Because in the end, if you use conventional um, gadolinium or iron or manganese based agents, the, the MR is inherently so super insensitive that you have three, four, five orders of magnitude if it comes to the concentration of the agent. So it means basically you, you come up with very complex molecules which are to, tend to be relatively large with relatively suboptimal properties because in the end our core strength is in nuclear that we go into the cell and you do not want either iron manganese or gadolinium in the cell unless you want to fight with chuck norris um, you know so it, it, it's really i think this is where the fundamental um, mistake comes in mr and this i was talking about hyperpolarization this could help but then it gets so complicated that this is not fun anymore. Okay, Marlene, Vicky, do you want to add to the fun part? No? <laughs> okay, um, I, I have another question that I struggled with when I saw in particular Marlene's and Vicky's presentation. So I'm an imaging physicist, I'm not a, a medical doctor and you may kill me for what I ask now, but. I had the impression that many of the cases you showed, you could argue that you can get the same reading, clinical reading, with looking at the images separately. Um, what is the true benefit of combining them in a PETMR scenario? And what is the short-term potential? Maybe many things could not, uh, have not made it yet to the clinic. Um, what do you think is the true selling point for PET-MRI versus PET plus MR? Well, I think one of the issues is, especially for radiotherapy planning, is the image registration, uh, because it really does matter if, if you are a, a slightly more precise and not just looking at one image and say, okay, it takes up some FTG around here and then transfer that uh, to, to your MR scan or to your CT scan. So I really think there is a potential for improvement there. Um, for radiotherapy planning, and I think that that is important. Okay, Vicky. 
And then from a more clinical perspective, from the patient experience pathway, what we found actually is that these patients are often quite debilitated. So they're often in pain because obviously the bone disease and what they don't want is actually having multiple visits to the hospital. And for them, actually, the, the advantage is having a single examination is much greater. But the other advantage that they, they would like to see translated through, and we're starting to see that with some of the AI enabled acquisitions, is that they want much faster imaging. So in other words, do the MR component in uh, much, uh, with the same information, but in a much quicker way. And we're starting to see that coming through in terms of noise reduction techniques, as well as accelerated imaging. And I think, you know, going forward, that's kind of where the patients want us to be. But taking this question a bit further, I can relate to the fact of uh, what you just said, Vicky, that in patients with pain, a single visit, single scan, two images is, is very worthy. What about the true synergistic use of both image information? So to me, in many times, it's like a convenient image fusion, but I think we fall still short of using, for example, the dynamic aspect and really the cross-relational interpretation of PET and MR images and the different 50 shades of gray of MR. Where are we and what can we improve to make better use of the image information? Question goes to all three of you. Shall I start and then the others can please, please add on? Please. So I think really the biological information, I think we are still a little bit short on that in terms of the actual clinical practice. So we tend to use a single biopsy, for example, to represent the entire body in, in multiple myeloma. And clearly we know already that if you biopsy actually from different areas, there's a different genotype and there's also differences in terms of the distribution of the plasma cell disease. So it's not just one disease, it's heterogeneous. So being able to, to capture that is an aspiration. I don't think we're there yet. I know that there are some um, sort of AI enabled post-processing that's starting to look at sort of a more voxel and regional basis, but we're nowhere close to the clinic with that. But that's the sort of aspiration that you can see going forward where you can also then target biopsy to certain areas where you've got that greater heterogeneity in terms of not just one modality, but actually two modalities and also two different physiological information. That I think would be quite exciting. Plus, I think going forward as well, having those MR sequences, which are much more, if you like, fingerprinting type sequences, I think, again, will really improve some of the heterogeneity assessment that we can try and capture. And I think that in that sort of situation, that co-registration is actually really quite important. Um, so you can't really just have two sets of images fused together if you really want to start doing that. So that's kind of, I think, where we're, we're starting to move towards, but we're nowhere close. Okay, thank you. Malina? Yes, I agree with, with uh, Vicky. I think it, it gives us the potential to describe the tumor in much more details because it's not only heterogeneity between different uh, metastases, it can also be the heterogeneity within a tumor or within the nearby uh, lymph nodes. And, and this information could potentially be really, really important if you want to do dose painting, for example, or adaptive radiotherapy. And, and you can deliver the radiotherapy quite accurately, but you really need to know what you're actually looking at. Uh, and I think we need tools and they will, maybe Stefan can tell more about that, to, to kind of integrate all the information we have from multiparametric imaging uh, and get a better understanding of that because we're not quite there yet. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Stefan. Yeah, no, I, I agree with most of what was said. I, I think the, the PEDIM R, at least in, in our setting, gave the opportunity to, to look at the processes um, with more time. So if you, if you compare uh, the, the, the schedule on a PET-CT where they do 25 patients a day, whereas on the PET-MR, if you do six or seven, this is already great. So we, ha we have more time to look into these processes closer and try to understand them. And I think this is something what, Although I'm looking since 25 years on these kind of simultaneous PET-MR things, I think we still do not understand that much. Um, and what I, I would really, initially I was rather um, optimistic about a voxel by voxel correlations. But if you, and this is something what I really um, recommend for everybody um, to basically spend three quarters of an hour in a PET-MR in trying to lay still. 
So um, this voxel voxel alignment thing is, is right now what I'm seeing pretty much of an illusion. And actually I see this already with on, on the PET CT, we have now a digital one, and even within a one minute block, patients move. So I, I think um, the patient always disturbs the picture. I think, you know, if, if you work with a, basically some phantom, it's, it, things are easy. But um, it, it, I think reality is, is every now and then um, different. Okay. Um, we're moving close to the finish line. I, I observe the uh, chats. There is uh, no chat question. I have two short questions. Um, one is very simple. We have seen a lot of investment into developing imaging uh, systems, PETMA, PET-CT, next generation of PET-CT. Do you, and I'm looking at Vicky and Marlene, do you feel content that the software that you're given together with these machines allows you to do everything you want to do? Is the software leaping ahead or tagging behind the uh, systems engineering for these type of machines? There's no industry on board, you can say freely. <laughs> My impression is definitely that it's it's lagging behind the software. And that's also the impression I get from some of my PhD students who are engineers. It, it, mm -hmm. it takes a lot of engineering mm -hmm. to, to do anything. So that is not very, um, very easy to implement in the clinic as yet. Okay. Vicky? Yeah, I have to agree at the moment where we would probably want it to be in sort of in terms of a clinic friendly sort of software when we're, we're nowhere close. I mean, if we just want to do sort of simple morphological visual assessment, then of course, you know, you can do that with anything pretty much. But once you start trying to drill down to anything more complex than that, you pretty much need the whole engineering department behind you, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, the medical physicists on site. So it gets a little bit interesting, but <laughs> exciting. <laughs> All right. Um, if you allow me one last question, I know it's not Christmas, but if you had a wish list with three wishes that you could ask to whoever wants to develop PET MRI, what would be your top wishes or requirements for the next three years? Just throw keywords or wishes to me? Could it be shorter scan time? Could it be a more compact device? Could it be more traces? What would do you think, what innovation needs to be put to the market in order to get this machine off the ground? Okay, I'll start. Short of scan time, for sure. Uh, patients also would like to have a wider bore. Um, and also for whole body imaging, something that's very light you know, around them rather than uh, sort of the cage structures that we have currently. Okay. Yeah, I, I would say more or less the same as, as Vicky, but especially the shorter scan time, that's really a, a challenge. And also, if, if I could get anything, I, want, I would like to have short scan time, but at the same time, being able to go in depth with the imaging focal, locally, but also do like a, a really quick and dirty by highly accurate whole body imaging for looking for metastasis, for example. So in a combination of that okay. as, as possible. Yeah. Stefan? More or less the same, but I think number one would be make it cheaper. I think the maintenance costs, costs simply kill us. Yeah. You know, if you, you have a certain amount of um, patients you can scan per day, which more or less defines what you can afford. And if you basically pay for a pet MR three times the money of a PET CT, when something is wrong. The bore is, I think, extremely relevant. Basically, when, when, we, when, when the, the, the pet MR arrived with the 60 centimeters and I was used to the 70 centimeter as a volunteer, this is a huge difference in, in scan time for sure. Okay, good. Um, thank you very much indeed for uh, supporting this uh, third Iatris hybrid webinar on imaging techniques and clinical applications. Thank you very much for sharing your expertise and experience. And uh, for questions, uh, I guess people know how to get in touch with the actress and they forward this question to you. I felt very much entertained and educated. Thanks very much for your time. Stay well and see you soon.